So what we have here is a little bit a time bomb. The time bomb is actually comparable a little bit with the one that was created 2006, 2007. So the important thing is the time, the time duration of the high interest level. I actually don't think that 50 basis points up or down make a big difference. So the Fed will have a lot of printing work to do to save these bonds. Sorry to say that. And yeah. I mean QE. I think a small retracement now. And once uh, the Bank of Japan is really getting serious again on a little bit raising interest rates or stopping their QE, um, I think that the rally in gold is not over. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the NJR Mining Guy on X, and of course, your host of this channel, and I'm really looking forward to welcoming back an old friend. And I have to admit, it, it was brought to our attention that we have, haven't had this guest on in a long, long time, and I must apologize. It, uh, I'm not sure why we always wait 12 months to bring him back, because uh, last time he was on was October 24th, and he made some brilliant, brilliant calls, and we need to catch up with him and need to see what his forecasts and predictions are right now. We chatted last when gold was at 1970, and he called for a breakout in gold. Right now, we're trading between 26 and $2,700 gold per ounce, which is an absolute ridiculous price movement for a 5,000-year-old relic. Now, we'll have to see what his price predictions are for gold, but also <laughs> silver. Silver and uh, s silver is the, you know, the other second uh, precious metal that we, we're going to spend a lot of time on today, of course course because uh he is really bullish on silver and i'm going to figure out with him why and uh, what his price targets are of course before i switch over to my guest you guys know the spiel hit that like and subscribe button it helps us out tremendously bringing guests on it helps us increase our reach and educate other investors especially in these times they're getting more and more volatile things are heating up so make sure to educate and help share the video with like-minded friends now Without much further ado, Christian, it is a great pleasure to have you back on the program. You're a portfolio builder. You call yourself over at GIP, and uh, I have to apologize. I'm not sure why I waited 12 months to bring you back, but uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Okay, great. So thanks for having me again. Uh, indeed, it was a long waiting time, but, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is we're doing long-term stuff here. And so, uh, I mean... It was not so necessary to do all the time uh, intermediary, uh, uh, how to say that? Uh, the checks. updates, right? Yeah. But they were other checks, right? Because, you know, things do not go linear. But I think it's the right time to talk now. It's about a year ago. Exactly. Yeah. October 24th, yeah. we released the last video. So we've recorded a few days yeah. prior to that. As I said, gold was at 1970. So almost $600 uh, uh, price difference here, which is an absolute ridiculous price move, if you ask me, yeah. which, which is positive. Don't get me wrong. Like it's just a big move in a, in a very short time for such an old investment vehicle or it asset. It was class, absolutely right? expected. I told you that it's going to happen. Yeah. And uh, I told you that silver is going to do something which is uh, technically very important. It's going to actually break the downward trend line. And it did. Yeah. Let, let, let's go through so other, otherwise, it is nothing to do with gold. But I told you it's going to break the line. It did. Yeah. Let, let's go through it. Uh, like, okay. let's, set a, let's set the scene a little bit. Like, let, let's start discussing the economy a little bit. Why do you think things are happening the way they're happening? And uh, maybe we'll start with our general question in general. Like, what, what's the state of the economy right now, Christian? Like, fr frame your or sh share your current mindset with us a bit. I mean, look, uh, uh, let's, let's start with the biggest country in the world. That's India. Uh, the Indian economy had an enormous boom and now gets a little bit of competition from the Chinese one. Uh, China had actually a massive downturn, which is actually uh, responsible for the over overwhelming downturn of the world economy, uh, which I talked about since two years, because there was a recession on a global scale uh, driven by China, whereas the the biggest boom was in India and the uh, US uh, was quite in the middle, a little bit leaning towards the Indian growth rate, yet far away from the Indian growth rate, Europe behind and uh, China last. So China last is very important because otherwise you don't understand the deflationary effect on commodities that we actually had in the last year. So 
because it's nice that my NVIDIA stock went uh, hyperbolic, but the NVIDIA stock going hyperbolic has nothing to do with worldwide demand on commodities, right? Worldwide demand on commodities actually needs that the biggest manufacturer on the planet would have had a boom. And as I said, it didn't. This is why we got huge stimulus measures now from the People's Bank of China in order to correct uh, that seemingly endless downward slope in the biggest manufacturing country in the world. So that means that was the answer. So the answer is, of course, sectoral. It's not, uh, it's not everybody the same. And uh, important is that, yes, India be did beat them all. right? So it's like that. The uh, U.S. certainly was number two with good econ economy. But altogether, we're not strong enough to prevent a world down slope, which we had. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a saldo. I mean, if you have uh, two going very well, which are not so small, India with 1.4 billion and the US with like, roughly 400 million, and you got a 900 million like the People's Republic of China, yet the biggest manufacturer, which was in a kind of permanent recession. Overall, it was a recession and uh, very, very, very um, different depending on where you did look to. Christian, are we out of that recession? Has that changed now? The massive stimulus package China just published about 10 days ago now. Um, it, is that changing course? Like. like, do you see trend changes? It might look like, but I mean, the first thing, what uh, the big big China stimulus is going to uh, is going to uh, is, is going to do and it's actually started already. It's taking out a little bit of the peak that went into India because China didn't grow. So we had an extreme liquidity flow into India, and that liquidity flow into India was because of uh, investors wanting to buy India, but also because there was excess capital, which was uh, going out of China because China didn't grow, and went instead into India. So this tourist capital, so to speak, is going to now, I think, leave the Indian market and go back to the Chinese market. Interesting. Very, very interesting. And because. Uh, I'm following like the Chinese market very loosely. I have to admit, it's not top of mind yeah, for some reason. It should be. Commodities, we have to. You know, the problem yeah. is we talk commodities, we have to. If we talk only what we do on a portfolio side, uh, sub portfolio stocks, they are okay. They are, I, I can live without China. I mean, I'm heavily invested in American AI and tech and, and, and semiconductor sector. There I can spare it. I mean, you shouldn't spare it either, but you can spare yeah. it. But our 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 same we have the same big amount of portfolio in in in, in precious metals, and there you can't spare it. No, no it's like the, the stimulus packages, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk copper here um, later yeah. in our conversation. Yeah, we, yeah, we need to talk about it, right? Especially silver, because yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so, so, copper saw a massive price boost. Silver seems still to be stuck in a trading range, like it, it can't break out right now. We'll, we'll talk no. about that again as well, but. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, yeah. Christian. But it was like, I'm just, you know, trying okay. to follow up on a couple of things you said as well. Um, a bit of a, based on, on our channel and previous like guests we've had on, you said the U.S. economy is in good shape or was in good shape, not really in recession. I just want to follow up on that. Like, um, on what on what do you base that? Like, oftentimes, like people say on our channels, like, well, the U.S. economy is already in recession; it's just not being reported. Like, small and uh, medium-sized businesses are struggling. I think even you said that in a, in a previous interview that there is a bifurcated economy. But uh, do, would yeah, you still agree I'm, the U.S. economy is in good shape? Look, I mean, I, I wouldn't call I wouldn't call um, a big diver divergence between the leading tech sectors and let's say the Russell two thousand companies. Uh, a recession. Fact is that the small, small and mid caps in the U.S. are lagging behind. I would actually not call it a recession, but it's a stagnation on a small mid cap sector versus there's tremendous growth in the tech sector. But the 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 total out of it doesn't doesn't uh, justify the word recession. Yeah. Okay, no, that makes sense. Not um, yet in a recession. Okay, so it's not a recession. It's a very uh, how to say that schizophrenic growth, relative growth rate in the U.S. 
Yeah, I th- looking at the GDP number, for example, 3% um, for the US, of course, doesn't signal a recession. If you just look at the hard numbers that are being reported by the government and uh, that we have to rely on, because that's what we have to work with here, because I don't go around and take surveys personally, right? I don't go around, ask small business how everybody's doing these days, and to whether businesses is booming or not. But so I have to rely on those GDP numbers that they're putting out. Like, wh- where is that growth then coming from? Is it solely tech then? Or are other sectors uh, following suit? No, it's not only it's not only tech. I mean, you have uh, pretty much uh, pretty well well managed companies in the U.S. Like let's say J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, or you have Dow Chemicals and stuff, which is not tech. Both of them, Walmart, which is tech in the sense of having very intellectually proven uh, sales models in combination of store sales and internet sales. Uh, so you have pretty well managed companies, and they are pretty big and such companies are able to drive a whole country altogether, uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, that the gross rate difference within the U.S. is uh, huge. No. I, I just pulled up. You can't call that a no. recession. You cannot call a boom. It's not a boom everywhere, but it's not a recession either. A recession would be a saldo, and the saldo is not negative. No, I've just pulled up uh, the S- the S and P yeah. five hundred and looked at the uh, the top performers, and uh, of course, Nvidia is first with one hundred and eighty nine percent roughly year uh, over the year. But uh, interesting enough, and we'll get to uranium in a second. But Constellation Energy is second in the S and P five hundred right now, which exactly. is uh, which I wasn't aware of. Either. I mean, Walmart isn't bad either. That's not a tech company. No, no, uh, KKR, uh, Broadcom, yeah. Royal Caribbean Cruises, they're all in yeah. the top 10 yeah. here, right? So yeah. that's uh, Netflix, that's a bit of a tech company. I'm just, curious. just scrolling down the list here, it's really interesting. American yeah. Express, so the banking side is doing well, Bank, B, uh, Bank of New York, Ralph Lauren even uh, performing yeah. decently well, yeah. which uh, yeah. doesn't indicate to tech because... Uh, Oh, sorry, not tech, um, a recession, as you said, like, because the luxury no. goods, like Ralph Lauren is a luxury goods item seller. So I, I, they're doing I don't okay. recession either. It's, you can't call it a recession. Uh, this is it's a very weak, it's a very weak uh, mid-cap sector, but it's not a recession. Yeah. No, I like that. It's like, it's, it's a good view. It's, it's a really good take. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's backed up by facts, so, which, which I really yeah. like. And it's, right. Um, in, in terms of conversation, like, are you concerned at, at, at all about what the Fed is doing and how? what kind of influence is it having on the markets there, Christian? Look, uh, it's very simple. I, we spoke in that, the last interview. I don't want to make it too long because every reviewer can uh, check actually your archive and look the last one. The important thing in interest rate that high is not if you make them lower now by 50 basis points or not. It is that it's going to catch uh, fixed interest loans by time. So the impact of the high interest rate policy as a whole policy will come with time because more and more uh, historically fixed rate loans, which still pay 2% or so maximum, will have to be renewed and thereafter pay 5 plus. It doesn't matter so much if it's 5 plus 3 or 5 plus 150. Uh, It matters that it's 5 plus. So again, the, the main impact of the Fed was the quick uh, rise in interest rates and uh, uh, the level today is so high that it's going to impact more and more and more and more credit um, credit agreements uh, which uh, of which the, the fixed term interest period historically uh, fixed at very low rates that we had before February 2022 is going to kick in. So what we have here is a little bit a time bomb. The time bomb is actually comparable a little bit with the one that was created 2006, 2007, because you remember with the subprime loans, so-called subprime loans, they actually had grace periods, and later on they had variable interest rate kicking in. So, And we have a little bit the same problem. The variable interest rate, which is extremely high today, as of, compared as of the moment, where these loans have to have been originally signed, uh, they are not kicked in fully. That means more time goes uh, goes uh, goes down the, the road. More of the loans are going to be uh, renewed, refixed, and uh, the interest rate actually payable on the loans is going to triple. Yeah. So the important yeah. thing is the time, the time duration of the high interest level. I actually don't think that 50 basis points up or down make a big difference. 
No, it'll it's take a while for, for traders for the yeah for traders for big companies, but for the for the recession issue, the point is how long will interest rates stay so high? We have now two and a half years of very high interest rates. That means I guess, and it's a guess only, that not even twenty five percent of the fixed interest loans have been affected by the high interest rate policy yet. Longer it stays, more will be affected. That's the message I can give you on that. It's not so important if it's 4.7 or 5.2. Because the level before was 0.5. You understand? Yeah, I, I, I get it. I know I've, I've refinanced my house in, at a low rate. If that one kicks in, you don't care because you pay five times more than before. And the important is how many households, how many loans will be affected by such event? Uh, talk, talking about that as well, just alongside that U.S. debt uh, as well, a lot of uh, T-bills need to be reissued next year, 2025 as well, at a higher level uh, as well. A lot of re refinancing needs to happen in that regard as well. It's, are you worried exactly. about that? Like, did, are, do, you look that look, do you look at that? Are you concerned? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the same like for households or for businesses. Uh, that's the problem. The problem is the duration. It's not exactly five, 50 basis points up or down. It, it, the, the bond market and the T-bill market is an interesting market because it seems to dictate a little bit what the Fed is going to do or needs to do or should do. Um, the bond market can be a bit of a bully uh, to, to a degree. So I'm curious, um, we're, we're, and we discussed this very briefly before hitting the record button, but the 10-year yield um, ha has moved up uh, to over 4% now. Um, yes, it, despite, it, it despite the rate after, cut. After, after they lowered the money market rate by 50 basis points. Exactly. I think we need to explain that a little pretty, bit. Like, why why ugly. is that happening? Because it should yeah, be coming down. Yeah, I can tell you why it, it shouldn't happen. I did predict it, but it shouldn't have happened. This is because the bonds have lost all attractivity at the moment. Because with 50 basis points less in the money market, those bonds should have gone up in price or down in yield. They did the inverse. They went down in price and up in yield. That's what I'm telling you. So you have a completely, in, in the U.S., in the U.S. dollar market, we have a completely inverted yield curve, and it will take a longer time to repair that. It's not funny. You, you sent me a chart before hitting the record button yeah. on the 10-year. Maybe we'll, we'll bring that up here, and uh, you, can, okay. you can explain a little bit to our viewers what are we looking at and what does it mean. Yeah, it's very simple. I mean, what you see is a price chart. It's not a yield chart, first of all. You see the price of the treasury bill, of an average 10-year treasury bill, okay? So, and you see that actually we had a, we had a rate cut, and after the rate cut on the money market, because when the Fed decides rates, they don't decide capital market interest rate. They decide money market rates. Yeah, somebody has to understand what it is. Otherwise, it will actually blow up our interview time if I would explain the difference that can be Googled or looked somewhere, the difference between money market rates and capital market interest rates. Fact of the matter is that the upward reaction that we see here on the right side of the chart, given a 50 basis points so uh, called giant rate cut that we should have a spike up we don't have anything no okay no, i'm just looking at when the first rate cut was it was roughly my hand shows on the screen yes uh, it's roughly around this where the hand was roughly, yeah, yeah. So. there was a minimal up, upward reaction much too weak afterwards it went down again you see what i mean no. so the fed will have a lot of printing work to do to save these bonds sorry to say that and yeah. I mean QE. That's exactly it was my follow-up question. What is the consequence of that? Like maybe we elaborate on that a little bit. Like it, what does... right? the, the con that's why I use price charts and not yield charts. Yield charts look very scientific, but they don't get the point, right? So if this is the price of an asset, and obviously even cheaper refinancing of that asset, that means 50 basis points rate cut in the money market don't are not able to have that asset, then somebody has to come and buy it, right? To get the price up getting the price up here means that you would put actually capital market interest rates down they are inverse to that price chart so if you ask me if you ask me what the fed should look at i, I gave you the answer to the question that's why i made the chart they should look at that and start to buy them no. so buying the, the... means QE. okay buying means <laughs> QE. that's what what QE is defined for they should start to buy them because they obviously don't get don't get those bonds up in price, even by a 50 basis point rate cut in the money market. 
and they might have so to do if, that in 2025 as well. Look, believe me, if they buy it, they go up. Okay, the dollar will yeah. go down, but they go up. Yeah, no, so 100. percent I mean, for example, you know that we are still QT running, so yeah. there's still there's still the Fed putting treasuries into the market. You see it there, they still sell treasuries. That's why the chart looks so horrible. Okay, and. It, I mean, uh, imagine that this is main reserve for banks. What you're talking here? This is a 10 year treasury. This is like a prime tier one reserve of banks, insurance companies, and so on. Look what they're doing with that asset. I mean, we don't hold it. Okay. You don't hold it. I don't hold it. We are happy with our private assets like, like stocks, bonds, and, and, and some digital commodities. But I mean, look at that. That's pretty, pretty badly managed, right? So, <laughs> I, I mean, it's not my asset. Just I strongly advise that somebody buys it and fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes makes sense. Like, it, it, it's yeah. interesting. Like, you, you touched on the US dollar. Maybe that's the next big topic. So, so bonds are doomed uh, or we'll see a lot of QE. Um, but I, don't, to, I didn't to sort see. Of... I said I, I advocate for it if I look at that chart. No. No. Yeah. Yeah, the Fed will have to step in at some point, and I'm sure next next year will be Somebody very telling. Cool, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's the, and um, we might have discussed this before, but the reporting on the bond sales, like the U.S. government bond sales, is really, really poor. Because I'm trying to find like statistics and numbers of how much is actually bought at auction at the time, whether it's a full hundred percent, whether it's oversubscribed, or whether the Fed had to step in and maybe buy some of some of the bonds because they weren't fully sold or some of the bills. Mm -hmm. And there's barely any reporting on that. And, no, uh, no, no, they are, they are, they are oversigned. So don't worry. They, they sell the bonds. The Treasury no. Department, as the issuer, can sell the bonds. It's not a problem. Just they get they get horrible bad prices for it. That's the problem. Yeah. They have to give up more of these things. No, no, no. Absolutely. It's not a problem of sale. It's not a problem of U.S. government liquidity. That's fine. Still fine. The problem is they are just they, they sell it, and the auction the auction, the auction auction is low, right? It's low. So, 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 so they, they can sell it at, at 4% yield, right? No. So, so just for my understanding, it doesn't go up. It does not go up. No. Yeah, it just doesn't go up. I mean, they can do what they want. It doesn't go up. So, so with such a capital market, you should do something. And I would end. I would like to end up there because not our job. Our job is private assets, right? But yeah. I mean, that was my advice to it. So, uh, uh, for for reasons of just uh, of just uh, uh, how to say that managing the product issued by the treasury. Which is that it's not a Fed product; it's a Treasury product yeah. by definition. Somebody has to buy them, yeah. if you ask me. So, so maybe just for my, I'm running into mental blockade here. So, you're saying the Fed should buy the bonds, but you're also saying that currently, at least, that the bond market, like any bond auction, is over overbought by whoever is buying right now, right? Absolutely. And it's not it's the not Fed right now. It's not a problem. It's the same like you go to a retailer, right? You say the retailer has uh, has actually full stores because it's gonna give thirty percent discount all the time. The question is not if the store is not full. The store is full. The Fed, the Treasury can sell its bonds. The problem is the permanent discount. I mean, is that so funny or not? Right. No. So, th so the question is maybe as a follow up, like how will we see QE? So will the Fed have like if the Fed steps in, like that means for me, it's like the Fed will only step in if there's no demand for the bonds. Right. No. Well, first of all, first of all, the the Fed could stop to make QT. They're still okay. doing QT. So yep. in such a market with such a price chart, they still sell bonds in. They are net seller. At least stop that immediately. Hmm. No, I haven't heard anything. I've been. I've, I haven't read. The, I haven't combed through the minutes of the Fed recent Fed the meeting. QT is still running. Yeah. So they've reduced balance sheet from nine trillion to yeah, seven trillion. Yeah, they do. They do reduce the base of QT, but they're still reducing balance sheet. They reduce the yeah. Fed balance sheet, so they're still they're selling in that kind of market. I mean, if you're an activist investor, uh, let's say in any let's say mine stock or so, you would you sell into that chart? I mean, that's actually killing. If you sell into that chart, you shouldn't sell in such a chart if you're an activist investor. So, okay, uh, for uh, for the sake of everybody. We see that the Federal Reserve of the United States is not an activist investor in the product of the of the U.S. Federal Reserve. Okay, fine. It proves you that American institutions are separated as they should be. The question is, how long is this productive to be so much separated, th those two institutions? Maybe we'll find out in January. Who knows? <laughs> but anyway, I tell you something. This chart is democratic. It shows, it shows you democracy. Oh, there you go. That's something, no, yes, and they're trying to be shows, bipartisan. It, it, and... shows, it shows that one state authority doesn't care about the product of the other one. No. 
Well, they're supposed to be bipartisan, and uh, we'll see. Like I was but meaning, January. Like... I mean, it show, no, but it really shows that the people managing, let's say, the U.S. economy, are seriously doing their charter. Okay. Yeah. Because the Fed says they're fighting inflation; they don't care about the product called Treasury. And you see the price chart of the Treasury, then you see that actually they don't care about the product Treasury. They don't do it. Sorry, no. some unstoppable <laughs> call coming. You know, try to stop that. Uh, no, yeah. no so, worries at all. Well, I don't know. This is Skype. This goes through all machines. So, so, so Christian, it's like re really interesting stuff on the bond market and that the U.S., uh, the, the Fed is actually doing their job and being not uh, involved in politics or trying to manage other people's problems here. And they're really following, as you said, their charter. So um, That's maybe as a, as a... question is if you find this funny. Should, should we find it funny? Or should we know. just be actually uh, happy about the fact that they're doing their job? On a level, yes, it shows you that institutions do their job and their job only. But on a national economy, on a national economy point of view, it's questionable if such an amount of this coordination is actually um, profitable, profitable for the nation. Which sort of brings me actually to the next topic, which is currency, which is the U.S. dollar. Then the question yeah. is like, if if we see QE and if we see this playing out the way you predict, like, what? How is it going to affect the U.S. dollar? What's your what's your take there? Now, if they actually have to buy those bonds, we are far away from buying. Uh, I was talking first about stopping to sell, so stopping QT, right? Uh, once QT would be stopped, which I would advocate to do immediately, then one has to look at the chart, how the chart would look thereafter, and then you can find out if you need QE or not. Uh, in the moment, uh, the most urgent stuff would be to stop QT. Now, once you stop QT, you see it's still not rising. But then, I don't know, then uh, if the Fed would have to make QE, that certainly would have a negative impact on the outside value of the US dollar and a very positive impact on the dollar price of US treasuries, as usual. And... Uh... You, it's, I, I it's really I, I love your I love our discussion. It's really challenging for me as well to, to to follow along, but also make sense of some of the things. And when when QE happens, let's say, let's assume the Fed starts expanding its balance sheet again. I keep coming back to thinking about Japan, who's been buying their own treasury bills and bonds for 20, 20 years now, right? Is is that the way the U.S. is going? Then is like I'm trying to come up with a scenario where a maybe the U.S. is saved, like in terms of its debt problem, or b like a scenario where where it makes sense. Like how can we live on without having to rip the bandaid off in a massive financial reset? No, look, I mean my my problem with my problem with your questions, which I appreciate very much, is that they're actually scientifically complicated, so I can't answer them very simply. I still try to do it. I still try to do it in a short manner. Uh, the, the problem why this big issue, which uh, many professors are actually all, all the time talking about concerning the Japanese yen, is not a problem, is uh, lay, lays in the specifics that the Japanese owe money to themselves. No. So, uh, yeah, it's like if you have, like you have, you're completely overdebted, but the creditor is your daughter. No. So, this well, is what happens in Japan. And the creditor is the daughter because all this debt, which is huge, like to more than 220% of GDP, uh, Japanese state debt, but it's held basically only by Japanese pension funds, Japanese insurance companies, and so on. So that means there's nobody who could sell it off. This is the only reason why it's not a risk. In the case of US treasuries, it's not the case. This is why it's different. The difference comes from the holders. You have to understand that it's also important with uh, with debt who holds it in japan because the yields have been so ridiculously low nobody else wanted to buy that debt from the start so it stayed in japanese hands as a result it's not a problem okay like, did do you see a scenario where the us goes the way of japan is is that a possible scenario i i yeah. keep coming back for it for years yeah, now i keep be, coming back to that there would be a scenario where the us could do that but first of all if you want to do that the first issue you have to do you have to bring the treasuries home because you could never risk to do that well where you have a big amount of treasuries held abroad if you do that abroad you have a huge risk to currency but if you take them home that means somebody could be the fed starts to buy all the treasuries which are outstanding all around the world and thereafter they are home then you can do what you want or then you could you could go into a japanese way 
You can't do it actually if you don't have if you don't have met the precondition of bringing them home first. Is that a trend we're witnessing right now, though? Like, it seems like China is selling some of the other BRICS nations are selling some of their bonds um, or slowly reducing their position. It's not a fire sale or anything, don't get me wrong, but it seems like there's a trend um, where that is happening. And somebody has to be buying those bonds off of the Chinese, for example. Absolutely. That bought, that, that, right? That's what happens. I mean, we have to add an, a sec an, an, another seller, which is the Fed itself. So the Chinese are slowly selling. The Russian Federation has sold or is sold or it's blocked. I don't know. I think even Arab countries, oil producers are selling or are not adding. The Fed is actually selling. They still do, do QT. So actually, it's a robust market. OK, the prices go down for those treasuries. But obviously, an American institutional market is able to absorb all the sales. That's what we see. So from the quantitative point of view, the market seems to be robust because American pension funds and I don't know who else, you know, are able to absorb it, you know, able to buy it, right? Um, the question is still, did they do it at the price of having lower prices? So this is what's going to happen on that market if it doesn't change. And if at least the Fed stops selling itself, okay, this Fed would turn around because now the Fed is like the Chinese. They're also selling into the market. The Chinese are selling to the market and the Fed is selling into the market. Uh, that's good for the outside value of the US dollar, which is not cheap in the moment as compared to other currencies. But it's not good for the treasury bond market. So the question is, when will the Fed at least change side or at least stop to be one of the sellers? I think first measure, stop QT. Once you stop QT, that means the Fed is not joining China anymore in selling treasuries, but at least stands the foot still, does nothing, right? So, and thereafter, you can still think about if it's if it's maybe useful that the Fed buys off foreign, foreign holders, which would be QE. No. Uh, one last question on that. So who, who's buying them? Like, and uh, my, my mind went to the yen carry trade, of course, but who, who's using that um, as, as leverage? Is it just institutional buyers? Who, who, who's buying, no, 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 who's buying up the market that. right now? You, you love to, make, to have me on a scientific level on which I'm pretty proof. Uh, <laughs> you maybe remember the, the Silicon Valley Bank issue, mm -hmm. Silicon Valley Bank issue. So after that, the Fed did actually make a program which enables institutions uh, to put in to put in treasury securities at par. So uh, if you ask me now where those treasuries are, they are at the Fed, but not owned by the Fed. So an American institution can buy them, which actually happens, and then deposit it at the Fed for getting a loan for it. So they are in the Fed. Don't get me wrong, but not QE type. The Fed is just giving credit on them. That's what actually happened in the moment. Okay. No, perfect. Awesome. Let's uh, l let's move on. Like really exhaustive topic, but it's an interesting one because uh, I, I like discussing bonds in the bond market because Simon Hunt, I think, on this show said once the bond market is the root of all evil. So I'm no, trying to should, understand. We, we, if you, I, I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely happy if we make one time a four-hour session <laughs> and we go through without shortcuts there because it's unfortunately a complicated matter. It's very complicated. I have to admit, like there's yeah. so many nuances to the metric, like the yen carry trade. How is that impacting the market? For the yen example? carry trade is super easy. The people are renting yen and investing something in the dollar market. And as long as the dollar yen goes up, they even make a second profit. And when the dollar yen actually goes down, well, then they, they have losses on the credit on the credit capital value. That's, that's since since trade. we're in that in that rabbit hole, while we're in that hole together, uh, yeah. said, um, uh, the uh, the August fifth crash, like the, maybe we'll we'll throw that into that conversation as well, since we haven't caught up in a while. But like we saw that bit of a let's call it a flash crash or so. Like I'm curious what your take on that was, because um, everybody cited oh it was the yen carry trade that sort of unwound a little bit that caused yes. that. Right? Yes. If, would you would you agree with that? Is that is that a correct statement? I do and, agree uh, with it. Just it's not the yen carry trade. It's another phenomena. There's two phenomena. So carry trade. You talk about the carry trade in a scientifically uh, justified manner. If you talk bonds, okay. So a carry trade would be you rent Japanese yen at zero five because you're not you're not gonna get it at the prime rate. You're right. gonna have to pay a surplus. Let's say you rent uh, Japanese yen at zero point five percent interest rate per year. And you buy American treasuries, which are yielding at four. That's a carry trade, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So now if the yen goes abruptly up, yes, such carry trades would get into problems. But obviously, we don't talk about the bond carry trade here because 0.5 to 4 is such a big difference 
that you need a lot of yen movement before you get a problem. Okay. Now, if you want to know what the flash crash was, I explain you the other stuff. That's the so-called liquidity margin crash. And there is crashes in which nobody lost money. Now it's getting even more funny. I just tried to explain <laughs> you how this works. Let's, let's, let's assume you buy some SPX 500 ETFs, okay? Good. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your initial, initial price uh, was lower than the actual price, so you have a profit, you put a stop loss. You follow me? I do. You buy the next tranche, on, uh, on, you buy the next tranche, and for that you take a yen loan, okay? Next tranche of SPX, you can take a future too, it doesn't matter what you, what you use, okay? Let's assume it's a future. So you go along the SPX future next tranche, uh, SPX goes up, you put a stop loss again, Thereafter, you, you even rent more yen and you go to the third tranche of SPX 500. Long, okay? It even goes into profit. You put a stop loss. Then you buy the fourth tranche. Uh, again, with a yen loan. Now you're in tranche number four. And this time, you go into a profit and suddenly the Japanese yen starts to rise. So you're going to get a margin call but you have a margin call while being in profit. You read me. You are in profit. You get the margin call, and that margin call leads to that the number of total positions you are able to hold at the same moment with the same equity is suddenly reduced. What you have to do there, therefore, you scrap the fourth tranche of SPX 500, okay? You sell it at the profit, at the profit. And the stop loss on the third tranche, which is in profit on the third tranche, may trigger. So you sell the next tranche in a profit. Uh, and that's what happened and nothing more. That means you were forced to take profits. You didn't incur a loss. I, I love it. Forced to take profits. Yes, but this <laughs> is what happened. Because you, yeah. if, you have, if you use a brokerage account, right, and your underlying, your underlying uh, rented currency goes up, that means the capacity of volume that you can hold is reduced. But nobody, the people always say that a forcing, a forced sale must be at a loss. It's no, nowhere written. If you look to SPX 500 or NASDAQ 100, there is almost nobody who is in a loss. Hmm. You got me. Yeah. You, can be forced, you can be forced to take a profit. That's actually what happened. And this is why the market rebounded thereafter, because there was no losses taken. Sorry, it's complicated, <laughs> but it's like that. And you see it, it's proven by the chart. Yeah, I so love it. It's like you're, you're a fantastic been, guest to have yeah, on. If, like, the, if, the, if the people would have been ruined because they took losses, they couldn't, they couldn't, start, they couldn't start buying immediately afterwards. No, no, they were just forced to take profit. No, it's interesting. I, I love having you on. Like you explain a lot of things like that we had yeah, never touched time, on. Like, unfortunately, if, you go, if you want to go to such complicated matters, <laughs> it's compli it's scientifically complicated i'm sorry i, I can't make yeah. them more simple it's, it's no it's awesome work. it's like I, I love how you explain it as well like it's it's those are topics that we've never really touched on like it was just brushed over in in the past so i really really appreciate that i'm learning the a august lot myself crash, here so let's make a summary august crash was a forced take profit no, perfect. I appreciate that. It's like, Christian, we need to move on. Like, we, we still have a lot of topics to cover because <laughs> um, I want to talk commodities with you, obviously. And uh, we need to talk. Let's start with gold. Um, you made a brilliant call. Gold is going to break out. We're trading at 1970. Of course, gold is at 26, 2060. What is it? 2600 roughly right now. Mm -hmm. I've looked at the actual price this morning. But uh, we're right around there. Um, 700 to $600 move. Fantastic. Um, let's quickly explain the move behind gold. Like, And were you surprised by the lack of a better term, by the violence of the up move. No. That's why I called it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wasn't. So, and, and it's uh, not the end yet. That I was going to say, like, do, do you see it continuing? Like, where, where do you see things headed for the gold price now? I think a small retracement now. And once uh, the Bank of Japan is really getting serious again on a little bit raising interest rates or stopping the QE, um, I think that the rally in gold is not over. Do you have 
price targets in mind or so, Chris, uh, Christian? Well, it's getting difficult now with price targets because my target was exactly the 2650. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we went there, right? So I actually have to look at my algorithms, but I need a little bit more movement to give you a new price target. Uh, there is a very, very, a very, very, let's say, um, now utopic one, which actually once gave me 3,700, but uh, this is not under, under light with facts yet. Okay. That's just the yeah. hyperbolic calculation. And I want to spread that because I, I actually want that such calculations get underfitted with more data. We don't have data in the moment. We are there where we expect it to be. And now we wait for new information. On goal. Got, gotcha. And maybe just to what, what information are you looking for? What data points are you feeding into your model? What, I, what are you I need for? to know. I need to know how the sell-off in gold, which is one and a half percent, it's not a sell-off. But you have to understand because the market is so big, it is a sell-off by quantity. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, how it's ending up? If it's holding like the small, the small uh, support levels at two thousand six hundred, which actually were tested yesterday. Or not i have to see those things without that mm -hmm. my algorithms can't give you anything solid um, on a new basis i mean those who trade and i do also trade but mostly i have physical gold so i don't trade but actually we have hedge stops at 2580 to tell you a secret in the moment and in case this rally would have a big pause or a longer pause my hedges would be 100 percent in at 2580 i don't care where it sings to right no. i'll keep the gold just be on the short on the future against it, cash the money, and then buy more gold once the market turns on the downside. That's yeah. my pretty, uh, pretty uh, nice method how I do that. Perfect. But yeah, just the potential up is, is more, is much more. So, and I, I can't tell you anything now. Um, okay, we didn't make the two seven. We didn't make them. Uh, I think I'm not gonna cry because of that because the rally was pretty huge. Uh, but now we have to be careful, collect some data. And I told you, I have a hyperbolic, there's a hyperbolic possibility which goes up to 3.7, mm -hmm. but not underfitted by data yet. Yeah. If you were to make it completely oversimplified, Christian, it's like buy, hold, or sell gold right now. Um, don't move your feet. Fair enough. No, no okay. Um, we, we, we discussed before hitting the record button that we're going to make silver a bigger focus of our conversation today. Yes. And l l let's talk silver. Um, and uh, I threw at you before before we hit the record button that I said, like, silver's trading like a base metal, right? I told you I'm not a chartist. Like, you're, you're the expert. And uh, But I've very simply, like, I, th I think I used trading view, very rudimentary, copper price, silver price, and the moves were pretty much identical. Now I'm challenging you, like how is silver behaving and uh, what, what's silver up to these days? Come on, I mean, let's let's <laughs> remind our interview pretty much a year ago. And uh, everybody can take it from your archive and view it again, which I strongly recommend. <laughs> and at that time, we still had a pretty ugly downward trend line in the silver price. And yeah, my let me pull up the chart, by the way. Yeah, that's the chart. And what you see here is the in green is this X downward trend line, which has been broken to the upside. And a year ago in an interview with you, I predicted that we're going to break that to the upside, right? Mm -hmm. And we did. Uh, even though that people might not like it or silver box might not like it, it didn't go far enough. This is a decisive breakup still from a year long downward trend line. Okay. Now, uh, afterwards, we had some spikes, as also predicted, but not on your show, because this was like less than a year ago. Um, we actually had some solid movement um, over that trend line. So we can say we are not a day over that trend line, but already several months over that trend line. And now very slowly, we're getting those confirmations which we need to see if that's going to hold and is expandable further upwards in totally different zones of price, like 50, 60, 70 dollars. And the answer for that is, first of all, you have to get, uh, you get, have to close the hole, um, the hole in the ship. Mm -hmm. Because silver, silver mining is pretty in well shape. Now, for silver investors, unfortunately so, because it creates an uh, offer. I mean, if the miners are 
doing a good job. They create a lot of offer, and that's the worst thing that a Silabat wants to see is big offer. That's how it is. Okay. Now, because the price is at an elevated level, so we have a silver price which is solid, and uh, I think no miner is going to make a, lo a loss on the total cost of an ounce of silver with prices that we have at the moment. So, so we have the disadvantage in silver that the production goes full blast because nobody is in deficit mining. The demand yet is not in full blast. It has started to be that a third of the normal peak demand is now in place. And that demand is not a base metal because silver isn't a base metal. And as in opposition to copper, silver is not an industrial metal because silver is an industrial metal for special industries only. And the biggest remaining industry uh, for which silver is absolutely crucial is energy. Now, uh, as in opposition to those industries where copper is a base metal too, which are broadband, so-called, call it industrial consumer industries, in which the demand goes up with, uh, let's say, with economic activity. That's why copper is pretty good to measure uh, economic activity. The poor silver or the lucky silver, depends on the situation, is not bought accordingly to the economic activity. But it's, it's bought when the economic activity or the direction of the economic activity leads to certain spikes of investment of certain things. Then you need silver immediately and a lot of it. And that most important certain thing is electricity. Okay? Now, okay, you need copper for any wire, but you need silver for building a power plant. This is the most simple explanation I can give you. And building wires happens every day, but building power plants doesn't. <laughs> okay, but now, thanks to first the crypto industry, which is dated years, along, years ago, and which did actually save silver. It didn't, was not able to, to, be, to put silver up, but the crypto industry did save silver because it needed electricity. Now we have the AI, which needs much more electricity. And since the AI is there in place, okay, even all the nuclear power plants are, put, are being put back into service. For that, you need refurbishments and you need huge amounts of silver. And that is what you see. I did not put the Van Eyck Uranium and Nuclear ETF now here, because if you would want to uh, talk about investment in uranium, uh, you would have actually have a uranium chart. That is an uranium and nuclear, because nuclear is a technology and uranium is a metal, so it's not the same, right? But it shows you that actually we are spiking up. If we're spiking up on nuclear energy, we are spiking up on the biggest potential customer of silver. Sorry to say that for the green silver box, but the green silver box should build more solar collectors because that's another silver consumer. The biggest silver consumers after the death of the analog photo industry are unfortunately in high technology wires. Yeah, for just building a cable, copper is pretty enough, but not for building transformators. You know what I mean? I'm sorry. So it's a peak industrial investment metal. It's not an industrial metal. But if that peak continues and we see power hunger, power hunger, then the bottom is in. That means every retracement downwards will be bought. And if you add to that a bias market, which might buy it from things like, let's say, currency issues or, or the old legend that silver is money, and you put that on top of that, but then you would reach uh, prices which are dramatically over fifty dollars. But you understand, the first thing you have to get, you have to get the hand under the price, and that is pretty much happening now, with the nuclear industry picking up again, with solar picking up again, with China going out of recession. Hopefully, thanks to the People's Bank of China's measures, we might be there for the first time in years. Is uh, thirty dollars the current floor? Is that uh, is, does that need to hold? I'm, what's I don't your care technical, about the floor. What's the technical floor? What I care floor? here, yeah. I understand what you mean, but it's not gold. The, the retracement gold, floor, gold right? Gold is a like, tier one yeah. investment. You cannot you cannot can, cannot compare that. Uh, I, it look pretty much looks like it could be something like a floor, 
Uh, unfortunately, I say unfortunately, because that means the miners are all mining at full blast. Because thirty dollars is enough to satisfy their 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 cost. So yeah. So it's a disadvantage if it stays at thirty and doesn't go lower. Yeah, sorry, it's a disadvantage for the silver bucks. Yeah. But it is like that. It looks like that. So we have full production. In order to get the price dramatically over thirty, we therefore need full demand. Full demand is coming. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Full production, unless we have uh, unless we have a correction, which as a pessimist as I am, I do not expect. So yeah, there's, that there's means no I reason expect for all our nice minor friends to to blast full production into the market. So they do the worst possible for the silver price. This is what they do. Okay. Uh, we have to actually wait for peak demand to come. But I just tell you, it's on the way. This is why I could make the call last year. Uh, we are somewhere between 30 and 32 in the moment. And uh, my only message is I think we could make it this time. Yeah, I remember you texted me. He's like, Kai, it's breaking out. It's happening. It's breaking out right now. You, you, That's I, what I, I couldn't find you. the text it in did. preparation I mean, of this. Did. Actually, it did. I mean, yeah. we, we were talking at levels of $23. So we are more than exactly. comfortably higher than that today. But still, it's not done yet. You understand me? Because our problem is that the miners are full blast producing. There comes quantity into the market, the market has to absorb it. So we really need nuclear to pick up, solar to pick up, maybe even coal to pick up, power plants I'm talking about, you know, uh, to get that absorbed and put the price higher. But I think we have a chance now. That's the message on silver. This is why the chart is not more interesting than the gold chart, but it's more actual. You can find more entries. Yeah, entry into the gold market at two six, I don't know where, uh, is pretty sporty, right? <laughs> but in yeah. silver, if you see now that let's say that um, that uh, lower prices are being are being bought immediately, that could be pretty pretty suitable for entry zones. I have to ask you the same question I ask you for gold. Do you have a price target for silver in mind? Anything near term, mid term, long term? I I have an uh, utopic calculation in case. In case the, the let's say the electric industry picks up uh, picks up fully, and uh, based on comparative models, don't rely on that because this is very hypothetical pricing. Yeah. That could be seventy or so up to, yeah. and thereafter you see you see what's happening thereafter. But again, uh, such things I can put you to a chart either by physics or by mathematics or by cross calculations. But I will never call that unless there is an underpinning by data. I can just tell you that demand, demand data are starting to flow in. A year ago, it was pretty thin. Still en enable, enabled me to call that we break the downward line, which we did. Now the data getting better and better and better. And um, we may make a breakout over 35, which is the first one which has to be. Uh, and thereafter, we see any further. Okay. No, fantastic. Like, is it's something it's... somebody should look at in the moment if he wants entry into financial markets in commodities. Not copper, obviously, because that's not cheap. No. You know what I mean? Oh, oh, absolutely. Like a buy, hold, sell, silver. Mm, by watching what I said, yes. No, yeah, on so dips. buy rate, yeah. You could yeah. actually accumulate on dips if you don't have too much silver already. But mm -hmm. I have to say one thing, which I normally don't say in public shows, but I do it as a favor to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the value that, that you have in silver should never be more than 40% of the value that you're holding gold. Mm -hmm. That second condition should apply too, because we're not talking about the same quality of investment. Yeah. Okay. No, appreciate that, Christian. Um, let's use the last three minutes here, real quick. Talk mining stocks. Um, where, where do you see the upside? I know you've uh, you've mentioned a name to me before we hit the record button. We don't have to discuss specific names. We can we can say very. You're, but you're, uh, I'm anyway, you know, you know, I was totally bullish on tech stocks years ago. In every interview, in every presentation I gave at your shows, in keynotes, whatever, it actually worked out exactly like that. Yeah. So that's my summary to that. And uh, I don't see much limits to some of the American tech, stock, uh, tech stocks. Maybe some, if you look at the fundamental data in NVIDIA, for example, the price is still a bargain. Sorry. 
You may what chart wise, the- you may say, yes, wonderful, the <laughs> rally is behind. No, they yeah. are oversold. They can negotiate any price they want. This company is cheap. Wow. Very cheap. Yeah. Because they're still, tr- like, I'm not an expert on NVIDIA because I know the, the valuation multiple. You don't have to be. You sorry. take a balance sheet. The company is sold out, completely sold out. They can negotiate with the customers prices, whatever they want. So, I mean, are you bearish on their balance sheet? No, no forget no, about no. the chart of NVIDIA. Forget about balance sheet. We're talking stupid balance sheet, okay? No. You're really saying that they are going to make losses? I don't think so. Now, I'm waiting for the new 50 series graphics card coming out, by the way. And I don't know if we've had those conversations about graphics cards in the past as well, Christian. Um, but uh, just real quick, mining stocks, um, what should we be looking for and uh, what, what excites well, you? We are undervalued, basically. We are in mining stocks. We have bargains basically everywhere. Okay. If somebody wants to actually uh, go into mining stocks, just one, one big uh, point here. Uh, have a look at mining stocks if they have a reserve quantitative capacity uh, because there is mining stocks which performed better than others uh, because maybe their production was at maximum that means they did not hold reserve lines um, that actually were not profitable and uh, those have been performing better the last years but one has to understand that in case the prices of gold silver and other stuff would further rise, those companies would be profiting from those rises, but only on the price side, not on the quantity side. And other companies which have reserve capacities quantity wise, they would profit with the actual amount of production on the price side, and they could add additional production. I would actually, I will not give advices here, but I would actually uh, um, advise everybody who is looking to jump into that market today to make these very, very important distinctions between the companies. Because taking reserve capacity with you means that you did actually pay in profit, which was lower the last years, for the sake of having the potential of that higher capacity. Because keeping capacity, which is not producing, is not for free. Okay. So uh, I, I'm actually um, sorting that way. Uh, if somebody wants to to get uh, paid information from me, he can call me. But if people have enough time to look, they can find it out themselves. No, fantastic, Christian. Like, what a wonderful conversation. I, I want to make sure we don't run over an hour here. But um, I, I really enjoy our chats every single time we, we, we you come on. Like I, what I meant by challenging earlier, it, it's just intellectually challenging. I love I love the challenge and chatting with you. Uh, very oh, different yeah. thought process than a lot of our other guests. I really enjoy that. Really thankful for your time. Where can we follow your work? Like, how can people reach out to you, Christian? Uh, no, it's very simple. You can write me an email if you want to be a qualified customer. But unfortunately, we still do not have formats for small customers or internet kind of uh, internet kind of pay seventy dollar per per month platforms. You don't do a and Substack I, newsletter, Chris? No, no, no <laughs> it's my problem. I mean, what we both can do, you can make uh, uh, interviews with me much more often if you wish so. And if you if you're actually touching uh, scientific topics as you did today, we could also put one in, which is much longer. I don't mind that. But uh, please apologize me that as a product range, and the same is valid for interviews, simplification, which goes beyond a certain point, is distorting reality. And I'm not somebody who does this. No, it's fantastic. Christian, I'll actually ask the audience right now. If you're interested, let's do a webinar together or something. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, we if... can do that at any moment. I'm glad to, to, to do yeah. that. I'm also glad to make you a keynote at, at one of your fairs. I did a lot of them, actually. I was but, going to talk to you about after this, after yeah, you, this you interview. Might do that. You might do that. But again, again, uh, it's important if you raise scientific questions. And that's what you're doing because you raise very intelligent scientific questions. It makes a sense for both of us to separate them from others and give them the time that they are needed to be answered. Otherwise, they will bore people who just want to know if they, if they, if they buy silver now, you know. No, perfect. You know what? We're going to do that. If you're interested in a webinar with Christian and myself, get a little more scientific on the matter. Please put a comment down below. I'll, I'll 
post a pinned comment as well. We'll do a bit of a survey. If we get to a critical mass, we'll organize that and we'll figure that one out. And uh, we'll, we'll set a time. And Christian, we'll get you back on. I really, really appreciate it. Tremendously appreciate your time and uh, always love chatting with you. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. You just heard it. If you're interested in a webinar, put it down below. Leave a comment. Leave a like. If you haven't done so, subscribe to the channel. It helps us out tremendously. And uh, we'll be back with lots, lots more here on Soar Financially. Thank you so much.